Ed started and sort of working down further into some more of the, uh, the details of how do we do this. We, one of the things, the opportunities that um, high-speed rail has enabled is not only electrifying Caltrain, but also en enabling us to really look at the stations and are all the stations and are the trains in the right place in the city so that we can better marry transportation and land use in San Francisco. So with that in mind, we've begun looking at sort of um, looking at some ideas that have been percolating in the city for about 25 years, and that is re-envisioning a portion of the Caltrain corridor and I-280. Existing conditions today, what we have for a significant chunk of the Caltrain alignment in the city is that it is directly underneath the I-280 freeway. They share the same right-of-way from the fencing that if you've been in an urban environment under freeways, um, it's, it's not a pleasant place to be. So what we have today is, this is the rail yard, and this is the northern chunk of two, I-280. The two of them together close off our street grid for about 1.3 miles, and they basically act as a deterrent to connectivity. And there are only two intersections that work, they're 16th Street and Mission Bay Drive. And it's important to remember that in San Francisco, like in other major urban areas, freeways only exist in certain portions of the city. So Caltrain alignment originally was a freight alignment. So it's no, not, not a surprise to you that in San Francisco, lower income neighborhoods coexisted around freight industrial areas. And that's precisely where we put our freeways. So there's a, there's a sort of environmental and social justice component to all of this. So today, we only have two intersections across. Here's another picture from the air of that same area. This is 16th Street, one of the intersections that crosses. And Mission Bay Drive is right here. It's currently being built. That's the Caltrain Yard. This is UCSF Hospital. Our Giants Field is right here. The Golden State Warriors will be right here. And this is sort of an older picture. Since then, you know, much of this area has been developed. You've seen all of its pictures with the cranes. This is 16th Street looking into Mission Bay. 16th Street is not only a major corridor that connects Mission Bay to the rest of the heart of the city, it's also a very well used bike lane. That's the only way for pedestrians to cross as well. So if you come into that intersection, look left or right, you'll see this. You'll see the Caltrain tracks, two tracks directly underneath the freeway. The freeway pillars are 30 feet on center. It's a very constrained right of way to work in. This is the other intersection that goes through. It's currently being built out by the developer. That's Mission Bay Drive. Lots of infrastructure. Lots of signs. This is the freeway immediately adjacent to that intersection spanning over our creek. And this is the neighborhood park under the freeway. And if you stand there, you kind of think, San Francisco's far away. We got a lot of infrastructure. A lot of infrastructure, lots of spaghetti. And then there's San Francisco kind of over there. What allows us to begin having these conversations and thinking about what we're talking about? Obviously, one of the major impetuses is high-speed rail. Thank you, Ben. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> the other one is the electrification of Caltrain. This is a shot of the Caltrain, existing Caltrain rail yard with the diesel engines parked. They um, park there, and they run their engines until about 11 or midnight, I think. The adjacent apartment buildings, which are built you know, right across the street. If you want to rent an apartment in this building or any of the other two from, from this developer, you are required to spend half an hour in a model apartment and sign a waiver that you spent that half hour so you understand what it's like to live next to a diesel rail yard. Because they had so many, they lost a lot of tenants until they did that. The other impetus, as, <clears throat> as Ed mentioned, is the downtown extension of Caltrain. So depending on who you ask, San Francisco has been trying to extend this set of tracks, this, this old Southern Pacific alignment, to the foot of Market Street, which is really the, our financial district since about 1900. Starting in uh, about 2000, we really got going, and we defined a project called the Downtown Extension of Caltrain, and it's now environmentally cleared. And this is its alignment. This is currently the Fourth and King Caltrain Station. The first thing that the Downtown Extension would build is a subway station. It's an underground subway and then it would end at the Transbay Transit Center. And these, the, these are the um, construction methods. And cut and cover and open trench are very invasive construction methods. In an urban environment, it typically takes 10 years, an average of 10 years, for the businesses adjacent to a cut and cover project to come back, at, you know, economically rebalanced. On Market Street, we, this sort of wags 
in San Francisco say that after we built the park system under Market Street, it took us almost 40 years to get the businesses to come back on Market Street. Another impetus for why we're having this conversation is, as Ed already set the stage, we have many land use plans. Uh, San Francisco knew that it was going to outgrow its downtown financial district about 30 years ago. We knew that we would run out of job space. And so we decided to jump across Market Street and plan for further density and job space south of Market. And here are some examples of some of the land use plans. And there's really a focus on this area. Darker, in either scheme, housing or jobs, means higher concentration. So you can really see that we focused a lot of density in South of Market and in Mission Bay, and this, these are the yards. Of the numbers that, that Ed cited that are assigned to San Francisco for future housing and jobs by 2040, 60% of those jobs and 30% of the housing are just in this fairly geographically constrained area of the city, very high density. We've also had been doing our fair share of transportation planning to serve all of this growth. The, the, we have a master developer for Mission Bay. It, Mission Bay itself was rail yards previously, so those are now being built out. The street grid is being built by a master developer, and the SFMTA has a project to bring bus rapid transit from sort of the traditional, from the BART system, basically at 16th Street across into Mission Bay. And currently under construction is our New Start Central Subway project, which will link our more traditional north of market neighborhoods to Mission Bay. So this is where we get into the weeds. If we're going to do anything that helps to better marry land use and transportation, we, start, we have to start thinking about the alignments and the up and down and left and right, grid separations and uh, alignments. There are lots of reasons why grade separations are valuable. I think technically the, the only reason we, that high-speed rail has to provide a grade separation is if they're going over 125 miles per hour. That will actually trigger a grade separation or else you have to have a certain number of trains per hour across an alignment. And that appears to be about six or more trains per hour in San Francisco. We prefer our grid separations to be subways. But in, the, in an earlier version of the high-speed rail business plan, that's not what high-speed rail proposed. High-speed rail's job is not a land use job. High-speed rail's job is to get the trains into the Transway Transit Center. So this is really our homework. But what high-speed rail proposed was keeping its trains at, and Caltrain at grade and dipping our streets. That would cause a grade separation. So this is, of the two intersections that I showed you, this is 16th Street being grade separated. Since this, this, this picture from High Speed Rail came out, this is now a high density residential development. And this will be another one. And UCSF has opened a new hospital. Here's another picture of that alignment looking east into Mission Bay. This would be all the pedestrian and bike, um, bike traffic would go through there. And the residential developments would be about three stories above the streets. When you do a grade separation like this, you have to also trench all of the streets that connect to it. So 7th Street, all the streets in the range of this grade separation would also need to be trenched. We have a grade separation like that in existence today in Oakland at 7th Street. Um, West Oakland next to the BART station. So just flip the train and the freeway, and you'll get, you, this is what a grade separation like, is like, like this is like. It's not a pedestrian, bike-friendly kind of environment. This is not an urban solution. It's not really something that we can tolerate, particularly since we've actively zoned that our major land use growth is on the other side of these grade, grade separations. And these grade separations are also, fin a grade separation of this caliber is also phenomenally expensive. This particular one was $275 million in 1992. It would currently be close to about $800 million to build a grade The other of the two intersections I showed you that would need to be separated is Mission Bay Drive. This was the High Speed Rail Authority's picture for how to provide that grade separation again by dipping the street underneath. The closest analog that we can think of to that is the Holland Tunnel. <laughs> Um, not, not very pedestrian friendly. <coughs> we want subways. How do we do them? So we've been thinking about this. One of our transportation agent planning agencies, the San Francisco County Transportation Authority, ran a charrette with a bunch of people a while ago to figure out, could we look at different alignments so that we didn't have to tr trench our streets? So the blue, that's the existing Caltrain alignment. This is the currently environmentally cleared downtown extension. We looked at, you know, can we go west? Can we go east? 
none of those really worked, of those particular lines on maps worked because we have many existing buildings that have basements and they have you know, a lot of uses. There's some constraints when you start doing things like this. You have an active, you have an active train line running underneath the freeway that you're trying to electrify. At the same time, while well, you need to provide grade separations, how do we do this? So here's some examples of, place, of, of things that we could do. We could take the current alignment and simply dip the trains rather than dipping the speeds, which is what High Speed Rail proposed. Reno did that through the retrack pro uh, project. We don't think that you can do that because there's too, there's too little space between the pillars of the freeway. And the result isn't particularly pedestrian or bike friendly either. We could keep the current alignment and do it, uh, just use a, a tunnel bore, tunnel boring machine. That would be a very long, very expensive, very deep tunnel that would probably still require us to alter the freeway. And then the third alternative is sort of take Caltrain out of service, put the train in a subway in the same right of way, cap it, and then you get Paris. That's what Paris did in our year. <laughs> also, very expensive, requires taking the trains out of service. And then there's a fourth version, which is, can you find a different alignment where there are no conflicts? And this, in fact, is an alignment that we're currently looking at. And this kind of thinking, where you provide an alternative alignment, allows you to keep running Caltrain and high-speed rail on, uh, on the existing alignment while you're building another tunnel, but then you could switch once you're done. That brings us to the idea of, well, if we're going to do this kind of thinking of different alignments, how are we going to pay for all this? How does all of this work? And that brings up the idea of taking down 280, which would allow us to put some of our own money on the table, do things that San Francisco does well, which is if you take the, the freeway down by providing an alternative subway alignment, the yellow becomes developable land. We know from the work that we've already done with the Trans Bay Transit Center District Plan that our land is enormously valuable and the financial tools that we can put on top of that land allows us to extract value and build a better city. And so it's possible for us, we think, to reduce the cost of the downtown extension and to make a better city by putting more money on the table. That's not a, a new idea. We've, different entities have thought about it before. And it has its own constraints. We could try to develop the, redevelop the rail yard in place podium development over the existing rail yard. That looks like it doesn't work because of the soil conditions. And, and then the, the, the other one that we prefer to look at is moving the rail yards all together to a different location. So let me just quickly leave you with why San Francisco is really looking at all of this very seriously. What we have in the books today in the next generation of New Starts programs are two projects. We have Bark to San Jose and we have the downtown extension of Caltrain. These are cost estimates from 2009. In 2009, it was approximately $2.6 billion to extend Caltrain from 4th and King into downtown San Francisco. Our Metropolitan Planning Organization recently re-estimated re those costs, and the downtown extension now is more like $4 billion. And also, in the meantime, because of cost increases in that project, this source of funding and this source of funding has, have gone away. And High Speed Rail and its new business plan proposes to not fund the downtown extension. So this idea, this older idea, has a lot of work to do in order to work. So let me just correct it. That 557 is still there. Well, it's not in your new business plan. You the, the 557 it. is. Oh, good. OK. All right. I stand corrected. In terms of next steps for us, we are actively pr pursuing a study with financing from the Strategic Growth Council, thank you again, Ben, and the Metropolitan Transportation Commission to look at some of these ideas of, can we move the alignment elsewhere? Can we put the stations in better locations to reduce the cost of what's on the books today and to create a better city and bring some of our own value to the table. That study uh, will take over the next two years. If it's successful and policymakers change direction, then we'll be doing some further planning and engineering. Um, and then we'll be ready to face outwards and look for pu public private partnerships. That's it. Thanks. We have time for one question. Oh, right. I'm told I can take one question, please. Yes, Jason. <laughs> Jillian, so, so you, you guys presented this to Petro Hill Boosters, which is the neighborhood that all these tunnels would go under. Could you say a little bit about what their concerns were um, with regards to this proposal? To Sure. 
So the Potrero Hill Boosters Neighborhood Association is extremely supportive of these ideas. They recognize that, um, that we're only going to electrify Caltrain once, and we're only going to bring high-speed rail one in once. Um, if you live east of the freeway in San Fr east of the freeways in San Francisco, you are completely isolated from the rest of the city in terms of the street grid and the transportation network. These are the once in a hundred year opportunities to be connected to the rest of the city. The neighborhood groups get that. Um, I'd say that there's some consternation from some folks about messing around with a freeway, as there always is. There are other groups that, um, for other various reasons, um, don't like the idea, um, and we'll have to work that out. <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you. you so much.